You're all very welcome uh, to this DSA webinar on decolonizing development and the African Charter uh, for Transformative Research Collaborations. Uh, my name's Sam Hickey. I'm the head of the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester um, and uh, a long-time member of the Development Studies Association, uh, which is the UK-based uh, membership organisation uh, for all of those who study uh, research and teach in the field of global development. Now, for quite a few years now, the Development Studies Association has been recognising the epistemic inequalities in knowledge production that are sustained uh, through colonially designed institutions and practices. My own institute in Manchester was formed along with many others um, as a direct outcome of uh, Britain's colonial uh, adventurism. Um, and the DSA has tried to highlight these. We've held many sessions at our annual conference um, to look at inequalities in knowledge production. Uh, we've highlighted issues of uh, race and development at the annual conferences. Uh, we have a, a study group dedicated to decolonizing development um, and a particular uh, set of groups on council, um, on DSA council that include Global South members um, and uh, seek to address uh, issues around the decolonizing development agenda. So this is one of a number of activities that we've been engaged with as an association. Um, the, uh, we have a full hour to discuss some of these issues and we've been joined by uh, an excellent panel uh, that you can see on your screen there. I'm not going to go into full introductions, they can be posted in the chat, um, but welcome to Isabella uh, Abadurin, uh, Chair of the African Research and Partnerships, Director of the Perivoli uh, African Research Institute at Bristol, uh, Divine Fu, Director of Institute for Humanity Africa at UCT, uh, Pulun Sagalo, uh, Chief Albert Latuli, Research Chair at the University of South Africa, and Peter Taylor, Interim Director and Professorial Fellow at, at the Institute of Development Studies and also a member of DSA Council. So we're going to have a series of a, a few rounds of questions for, it, for our panellists. Um, trying to get up to speed with where the current agenda is for decolonizing development studies, looking at what the Africa Charter can contribute to that, and trying to identify some of the positive ways forward that we could think about. Uh, and our expert admin team will be fielding uh, questions from the audience uh, as we go along. Okay, to, to get things going then, um, I've got a question um, for Pleng. Um, I'm interested in where you think uh, you would say that we're up to on the ongoing journey towards challenging racial and historical inequalities within ac academia that have been deep targeted by the decolonial uh, agenda. What sort of status from a, from a Global South perspective, from a university in South Africa specifically, what status does the agenda have and what kind of progress is being made? Um, thank you very much, Sam. Um, I think the, the journey to challenging the racial and historical inequalities, as you put it, within academia is an ongoing one, right? Um, the scale keeps shifting, I believe. Mm -hmm. We're finding ourselves in spaces that are enmeshed um, within the capitalist system and commodification of education. Um, and all of these also are at, at the core of knowledge production as well, the commodification of knowledge production, right? These inequalities remain many as people continue to struggle to get access to good quality education in a country such as South Africa. And this is at the basic level before we even begin to speak about the epistemic injustices that are glaring at us. So the, the decolonial move, however, uh, continues to give us hope by persistently challenging the status quo. The agenda to center humanity first and foremost is a critical one, I believe, for decolonization. So we have challenges um, and, and colleagues such as Lachwayo and Alexandra and others have argued that universities as they stand right now in the global south 
continue to grapple with the ethical demands of decolonizing and transforming the public university and its epistemic orientations. So in many of our universities right now, we're grappling with a lot of things. There is an increasing demand, um, and some colleagues have argued, there's a demand for change. There's a demand for transformation, which we talk about often. There's a demand for decolonization, and there's a demand for decommodification of the academy, which is now at the center. So, um, However, I'm sorry, my phone is ringing on the computer as we speak. I do apologize, colleagues. <laughs> we can't hear it. Your so, phone. Yeah, there, there are policies in, in certain institutions uh, that are in place. We speak about decolonization, we speak about transformation, but when it comes to reality, what is there? What is in place? Right, because the, the, the persisting inequalities continue to be there. And this is why we ended up in South Africa having movements such as Fees Must Fall, such as Rose Must Fall, because of the need and the call for this change uh, within our institutions to decolonize our institutions. Um, and just as I conclude, just one thing that I want to highlight um, as, as, a, as a practical example in terms of what is also at the core of the need to decolonize is the issue of language. The issue of language remains a challenge. The Euro-Western languages dominating the academy and, and publishing spaces also where we can only publish in English mostly, um, continues also to limit. Because as we know, language is not neutral. It carries histories, it carries our worldviews, it carries the ways of being, it carries our identities as a people. So this remains a huge challenge. While there's been some move towards encouraging publishing in African languages, we know that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Publication houses are still controlled by the global north. So that says a lot and resources also remain a challenge. And this is all at the core or at the heart of the colonial project. Colonialism was entrenched through centering European languages, a deliberate move that was meant to kill our local languages. So part of the decolonial agenda is that we need to be deliberate in our efforts to recenter African languages in the knowledge production and collaboration endeavors. So I think I will pause here. Well, thanks, Palang. It's good to be reminded that these are debates that are situated within the even, even higher level debates in some ways um, around the nature of global capitalism at the moment, how it's historically developed and the process of modification that have flowed from that. Um, Divine, what would you what would you add to that? And, I, and I'm, I'm interested to, to hear may, maybe specifically as well, um, whether or not the agenda, the decolonizing agenda has maintained that it's it's high point, I guess, with the with the road statue falling in South Africa and so on. Is there is there any sense in which it's 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 gaining momentum or losing momentum? What 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 would you say about where the agenda is currently up to? Uh thank you very much, uh Sam. And also uh a thank you to the DSA for the opportunity of this. Uh, webinar and also a series of other discussions uh, and I'm sorry that I cannot join you uh, in the weeks ahead you know and also towards the end with the very important conference that you um, uh, are having I mean for both personal reasons and also for principal reasons so um, but it I think I want to start to continue from where uh, my friend and colleague Puleng uh, has, uh, has has started by really saying that we, we are going through a very important moment in the history of humanity. So, uh, and, and it's important to acknowledge, to acknowledge this moment in which we are located. Uh, and uh, it is easy to see emancipation projects as provincial projects. So, uh, and that is often our response to all emancipation projects. So when women stand up and say that the world is patriarchally centered and misogynist. Immediately our response is that we need to create solutions for women and this is about women. You know, when indigenous communities stand up and say, we need to rethink this warped world, we say, no, it's about indigenous persons. Every emancipation movement 
It's about cohabitation. It's about moving towards a dignified world because the world is problematic when we exclude one group of people. The world is problematic when we exclude two groups of people. And that's also why uh, I, I think seeing uh, decolonization as a push for dignified cohabitation is very important. So uh, uh, seeing decolonization as decentering frameworks uh, that have uh, created uh, what I think Judith Butler talks about uh, terms of recognition, because the current tools that we use have reduced our terms of recognition. And as we're seeing with Palestine, with Israel, we're seeing with Sudan, we're seeing with all over that some bodies are more mournable than others. We are seeing that some bodies are more susceptible to destruction than others. Some bodies are countable than others. So we do have an issue. So it's no longer just an issue of Africa, an issue of Asia, an issue of women, an issue of people with particular sexual orientations. It is clear that this connected world that we find ourselves in needs new way of rethinking it and rethinking it in a way that we see ourselves as connected and we see ourselves uh, as interdependent. And I think that's a challenge that for a long time, the colonial framework, uh, which of course colonization, uh, we should not forget actually is a framework that privileges particular people. So uh, a colonial project is meant to build a particular society. So it is good for one people, but not for another. So <laughs> colonization, we should not forget that is good for British people. Colonization is good for French people. Uh, for colonization is good for Americans, but it's very problematic for those who are considered as bodies that are disposable and who can be exploited, you know, without thinking. So this project is really around that. How what are the foundations that allow us to think about a better humanity? And we can see that it transcends just the surface, that the epistemological basis, the ontological basis, the cosmological basis, the theoretical basis on which the ideas that constitute this relationship need to be rethought. And that is why this, um, decolonization project is really about. It's about this cohabit. How do we rethink? How do we reimagine? Uh, given that we are stuck in this moment, you know, and I think that so far, what the resuscitation of this thinking, especially uh, in South Africa during 2015 has done, is to bring this back to the agenda, to tell us that even though we are progressing, and even though we are investing in improving the world through frameworks such as development, we are still reproducing and deepening those inequalities and those problems which have led us to crash at this moment. Because in fact, the market, the market of human dignity has just crashed. Uh, the market of international law has just crashed. And decolonization as a framework is really allowing us to think to so there is there is there are other ways of doing this. This cohabitation is problematic. And if we begin to address this at the epistemological level, at the level of knowledge production, the techniques we use to produce knowledge, the data we depend on to produce knowledge, the data we depend on to produce good, to transform the world, to prioritize what we consider as development priorities, then uh, we are going to transform the world in, in another way. And I, and I think that the critique has come on board. What we now need to do is really to invest in uh, the epistemological work research, to invest in the theoretical work, uh, work, to invest in the methodological work that allows us to move to this more dignified space. So that's where we are. We are mm -hmm. in the journey. The journey has moved a step. Now what we need to do is to give it the intellectual work that we need to do. Because as I always argue these days, it's a paradigm shift and we have to treat it as a paradigm shift. Yeah, thank you. No, thanks, Divine. It's an excellent way of framing it, dignified cohabitation. I'll come to Peter on this in a minute. Um, but this idea of a sort of connected um, universalism almost, it, it seems odd in some ways. I think what you're what you're trying to identify is, is to not to have a relativist partial project of decolonizing, but you're reaching out to something universal, however framed. And there's an
a tension in many debates about decolonizing that thinking universally tends to mean thinking from the West. Whereas I think uh, if we can go back a bit further, Frederick points us back towards in, in the question and answers, points us towards going back before colonialism. And other writers have pointed out that the, the emancipatory origins that you've also flagged around the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment wasn't just a Western moment. There was a, there was a lot going on. There was multiple modernities and multiple civilizations involved in that moment of where emancipation becomes a, a project. And I think maybe Frederick, uh, part of the challenge is to, is to reach back uh, to that uh, that moment of connected um, emancipation there. Um, your, your challenge around dignified cohabitation is, is I think an interesting call for northern-based academics. I'm going to come to Peter now. It suggests that we can have, you know, those of us based in the global north can have no real dignity in a system in which we are um, holding uneven uh, levels of power. Um, I wonder if that's what you think is driving um, the strong interest in decolonizing agenda um, in the among global north organisations. Also, perhaps whether you think that agenda is somewhat losing momentum or facing any type of backlash. Actually, yeah, thanks. And I think there is real um, attention and traction being given within northern institutions, uh, a range of different kinds of institutions involved in one way or another with development studies. And I think a particular you know, reason for that, I, I'll just include my own institution at IDS, uh, at the DSA itself, Sam, as you mentioned earlier, that we are paying attention to this with a particular emphasis on changing the status quo, as Pauline pointed out is needed. Actually, at IDS, we refer to it as recasting development and development studies, um, as uh, Divine has just been highlighting the need to you know, rethink, reimagine what we're talking about here. So why is this? Why is this attention being given? Well, firstly, I think there's a recognition that development studies has a normative agenda, and it engages with complex challenges that so many face in multiple contexts globally, even though how those challenges play out is very contextual and determined by a whole range of factors within those contexts. And we've seen evidence and experience time and time again that these challenges can only be addressed through equitable, inclusive processes that value and bring together multiple forms of knowledge and experience. So working towards epistemic justice, as Poleng and Divine both noted. And development studies is really interested in generating and using knowledge, not simply for its own sake, but as a means of offering concrete approaches that can contribute to wider political change towards a more equitable and sustainable world. And also within the development studies community, there's growing awareness of the need to acknowledge and welcome the coexistence of different development debates. Sometimes it's referred to as a pluriverse. And Sam, as you just uh, you know, uh, mentioned, we've been engaged in a debate around universalism and understandings of universality in the context of development, which is really important to have these debates and, different, and to hear these different perspectives, because they can actually inform each other and then help to identify potential areas for practical action on decolonizing knowledge for development. And for development studies uh, institutions, that can involve different approaches, how we do research, how we teach and learn, uh, how we engage in the world. And actually, this is also the subject of a of an ongoing engagement and dialogue with the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes, uh, EADI, which some of us on this call are also involved in. And uh, I'll put a link in the chat in a minute, which can uh, refer more to that. Just to say a couple of other points, these dialogues and debates around decolonization are also linked to some interesting conversations around the idea of localization, which is particularly, uh, I think, a funder uh, oriented conversation, but that's involving practical measures by funders to ensure the resources needed to undertake research are directly going to researchers in the Global South. And, and that has important implications for partnerships between researchers in the Global South and North. And finally, there's a really strong interest, particularly amongst funders in the Global North, including in the UK, and increasingly amongst development studies researchers in achieving more equitable and authentic partnerships that underpin research collaborations. And this is something I know the Africa Charter is really laying out an important agenda on, which I know Isabella will say more about, and uh, I'll come back to saying a bit more about this later as well. Thanks. Thanks, Rich. Yeah, let's move on to Isabella, and then we'll definitely revisit the idea of partnerships as a, as a way forward. Uh, Isabella, can you uh, introduce the, the Africa Charter um, to us, please, um, how it came about and what it aims to uh, achieve? Oh, I think you need to unmute. Is 
Still not hearing you. Winnie, I'm not sure if we can unmute Isabella from our end. No. Unmuted. Yes, no, okay. Here we go. Okay. Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Sam, and, and my thanks also to the DSA for this opportunity. Um, in many ways, the development of the Charter was a child, if you like, of um, a context in which there was a growing and expanding, intensifying debate on the one hand around decolonization, of, as uh, you know, Divine, Poulain and Peter have just kind of sketched, and on the other hand, an, a sort of a growing debate around the need for equitability, for greater fairness, for greater equity in research partnerships between you know, the Global South broadly, Africa specifically, and the Global North. And what the charter process, the, the initiative to develop the charter really was seeking to do was to shift the locus of considering what greater equity and research partnerships really needs is to is for you know what is the purpose of greater equity in research partnerships and what consequently do we need to understand equity as entailing the charter for a, to a large extent much of the debate around that really was being had in the global north or led from the global north and the charter initiative was trying to shift the locus uh, of considering these questions firmly to Africa and you know building on systems thinking on the one hand and then a long established body of post and decolonial scholarship from the continent as well as the wider global south the charter really pointed to the importance of highlighting the need for systemic change, change in the global science and research ecosystem as a whole, change in the unfair and skewed positionings of Africa and Global North in that system, um, and, the, and the very unfavorable positioning specifically of Africa in that system, you know, and all the metrics that we've got ranging from, uh, from rankings to the number of uh, researchers produced to the percentage of outputs, uh, uh, scientific outputs produced, really point to this unfavorable positioning of the continent in the global science uh, uh, knowledge production system. So the charter highlighted the need to change that system, and it understood international research collaborations as an entry point for doing so. Because if you look at uh, the, the field of scientific production that comes from the continent, you see that a large majority of that, more than 80%, uh, in some countries, almost close to 100%, derive from collaborations with the Global North. So if you shift the ways in which these collaborations are configured, you have a chance of advancing shifts in the system as a whole. And the charter argued that you know those shifting the system, rebalancing the system to ensure that scholars and institutions and knowledges from the continent take their rightful place, is a matter not only of social justice. It's a matter not only of advancing the aspirations of the continent, but it is a matter. And I suppose this goes back to Divine's point about you know emancipatory projects are not provincial projects. It's a matter also of forging, fostering a scholarship, global scholarship that is richer, that is more potent, that will enable us to find solutions to the collective crises that we face, that provides alternatives to the monochrome logic of Western thought. So this is what the Charter um, argues, and it, it shows how collaborations need to be configured to be transformative. Uh, by making sure that collaborations redress each of the multiple layers of power imbalance that uh, pervade so much of Africa Global North knowledge production, which, you know, Poleng Divine have spoken to, and Peter also at the epistemic and language levels, level of theories and concepts, the development frame itself, uh, the institutional resourcing and capabilities and the disparities in that, as well as, of course, you know, um, 
more concrete asymmetries in the in the arrangements around division of labor and so on in in collaborations so this is what the charter is and it was developed uh, as a joint effort by the major higher education constituencies in the continent the major bodies association of african universities african academy of science arua codesria and so on uh, they all came together and decided to co-create this framework as a joint endeavor i'm going to stop here sam and i hope that's given a, a sense of what the charter is well, it's very clear, Isabella. Thank you. Um, and there's plenty more on the Perivoli um, website. Can I just um, pose Frederick's question to you in, from the Q&A? Um, to what extent, you know, what's the number of signatories, for example? So every uh, lots of universities have been approached uh, to sign up to this. Um, how, do, you have, do you have a running total or a sense of how widespread the signing up for it? And then there's a second part of Frederick's question is to how will we know when things have started to be achieved? Um, or whether or not there is a, uh, some systematic indicators uh, to check progress. <laughs> Thanks. To uh, one question is easier, the other is uh, is uh, needs a more expansive answer. Let me start with the easy one. So yes, we do have a running total, and at the moment we have over a hundred uh, bodies that have signed up to the charter. That includes, you know, major universities, you know, in the continent, in Europe including in the UK, as well as in North America and some in South America and Australia. Uh, but we've also had major uh, sort of university networks signed up to the charter, as well as some learned societies. Um, and, you know, the, the number of, the, the number of, of signatories is, is growing, continues to grow. It seems there is a widening sort of a ripple effect where more and more institutions become aware of the charter and then sign up. And then in addition to those that have actually signed, you know, there is also a growing sense, at least in the UK, but also uh, more widely that funders, publishers, to some extent, some government agencies are taking note of the charter, are beginning to engage with it, or at least are beginning to engage in the thinking around what the implications of the charter might be uh, for their work. So, so there is a sense that there's a grow, growing movement and momentum, a community of interest, if you like, that's coalesced around the charter. And the big task now, and this goes to your second question, obviously, is finding ways to move from that community of interest to a community of action by identifying how the principles and the aspirations of the charter can be translated into practice you know across different spaces and that is a big question um, and what we need to do now is actually collectively engage in processes of critical reflection and review on our existing collaborations, on our existing you know, policy structures and the ways in which they perhaps already go some way towards redressing the power imbalances, but also where they serve to sustain some of the power imbalances that the Charter speaks to, where we can find promising approaches, good practice, where the gaps are that we really need to find ways of redressing. This is a joint, this is endeavor we have to engage in collectively. None of us know the answers yet. We have to do this together, you know, mm. both in the continent as well as the global north. And, and so for that reason, there are no metrics as such yet. You know, mm. there's uh, no indicators. It's way too early for that. This is a, a joint learning process that we have to pursue uh, together. Thanks, Isabella. You may want to check in the Q&A. There's a question as to whether or not the Africa Charter will be translated into Swahili and potentially other ones, but I'll leave you to type your answer there. Okay. Divine, um, it, also in the Q&A, um, Chris Lyon has raised a, a query about whether your talk of, um, of um, connected uh, approaches uh, and, and tilting towards something quite universal may clash with something in the Charter around um, a rejection uh, um, of uh, Western-centric um, universalities. Um, and really a question of whether, what should we be aiming for here? Is it a pluriverse uh, of many alternative epistemologies um, or is it a new 
wider universal inclusive epistemology built with upon various traditions have you, have you i'm not sure you've had the time to think that one through but what would your perspective be on that and other challenges raised by, raised by the charter yeah uh, thank you very much and also thank you for the question and thank you uh uh, Isabella, Peter, and colleagues, you know, for uh, for what's a fascinating uh, and very rich uh, discussion. I don't think it's intention at all. <laughs> um, I the, Isabella uses the term monochrome logic, uh, which I think is is very important. It's something deeply associated with what we have come to term. Eurocentric knowledge. So uh, Eurocentric knowledge, which is a way around which knowledge is organized and how no uh, 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 knowledge production is done and how interpretation is done uh, and associated particularly emerging from Europe uh, is, is what we uh, are talking about. And a monochrome uh, logic, when you read uh, Mignolo, when you read um, uh, Dabashi, you know, Dabashi, the Iranian scholar, you know, who is based in the US, Mignolo uh, from uh, Argentina. When you also read uh, uh, Andlovu, or you read the f f feminist critiques, like uh, if you get Ifi Amadiume, if you get Oyeronke, it's, it's, it's challenging this monochrome logic, you know. So a monochrome logic does not allow uh, for the space for other epistemic frameworks to breathe. So how can we leave and let leave? So the idea is to expand uh, rather than to contract. The idea is to enrich uh, rather than to annihilate, you know? So uh, I think that what we are talking about is universal universalism with an S, universalisms. And a, plur a pluriverse is really embracing this idea that there, there are universalisms. And, and I don't think that they, they are necessarily intention. I think, I, I think that what we need to do is just to expand the universalisms uh, that we, we, we have. Uh, but also uh, embracing the idea that we are interconnected and that if we believe that science is actually a universal project, and that inquiry is a, is a universal uh, a project uh, that we are interconnected. You know, we participate in this universal project. The problem has been that there's been a distribution of labor where one group of the world is just fit to produce the raw materials, while another group is just meant to produce theories that need to be applied by other, others. So the different centers. So the, the idea is to, enrich ourselves by allowing ourselves to do science, by allowing ourselves to do knowledge production, by al allowing ourselves to be able to participate equally within this space. I think we are enriching uh, uh, rather than, than narrowing. Like I always say, there are lots of discoveries that we've missed out on. Uh, uh, a few years ago, I was doing work uh, in the uh, corrupt forest. I so just saw a question about the environment, <laughs> you know, uh, a, a climate-related question, which is coded under uh, an, another question. So uh, a few years ago, I was working the corrupt forest, and it was a time when uh, environmental work was about resettlement. Uh, Europe had this idea that to protect nature, you needed to go down to Africa, send out people from the forest in order to protect the forest, you know? And we did baseline studies during that period. And we argued, you, should, you know, people are, you know, intertwined with nature, they live with nature. There is a kind of a balance and, and you need to maintain that balance. But the argument during that period was resettle people outside, give them houses and protect nature because, you know, they must be separate, you know. I mean, today, what's the argument? <laughs> you know, we need to live in twine nature. We have people building gardens in cities, having to go back to nature and others. It's, so when we miss out, when we provincialize knowledges from other parts of the world, we subjugate knowledges, I, I think we do ourselves a disservice. So um, I would say these are plural universalisms rather than uh, just pluriversality. We we need to expand knowledge rather than con uh, and, than, than contracted. Yeah, I don't Thanks know. If... I think there are many other epistemologies other than those that have been dominant, which do have um, much more fluid 
uh, fewer barriers between uh, human and, and non-human non um, species. And the more they're brought to the fore, I think that may start to address the, the challenge raised in the, in the question there. Um, um, Poleng, what, from, from your perspective, um, is there a one critical aspect of the chart? If it has six different dimensions, some of them are interconnected. Would you identify one that really needs to be done tomorrow, um, if not yesterday? Uh, what's, the, what's the one that inspires the most urgency in you when you read through? <laughs> um, so I think that's a very tough question because I believe all the layers um, that we highlight in the charter uh, are pressing issues, right? Um, but they are interconnected. If I can zoom in on one uh, for the sake of the discussion today, um, I would say the, the development gaze. And this is something that I think Isabella touched a little bit on. And I think also just um, in his response now, also Divine kind of touched on it as well. Um, and I think in some ways, then it also really uh, shows or speaks to the urgency of it. Um, in, in, in the layer where we discuss the development gaze, we highlight how Africa has and is constantly perceived as this perpetual beggar and, and child that never develops, right? So this perpetual developing, 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 um, which is really a challenge. Um, if we think about um, what it is that uh, needs to be done. So this, this layer, challenges the notion of Africa as a consumer and not as a, pro as, as a producer without critically engaging the structural and power imbalances that deliberately render the continent this way. And I think as Divine has just articulated, uh, by, by looking at the continent that way, we miss out uh, on a lot of possibilities in terms of how we can attend to some of the global challenges that are facing us. Um, the issue of cl climate change, for example, what is it that we're missing out if we're only assuming that knowledge can only be produced from one center of the world? Um, and this moves from our communities in the ways in which communities within the African context, in this case, the global north more broadly, are treated uh, to our academic institutions, again, where the Euro-Western monochrome logic of thinking and understanding the world and theorizing is always assumed to be coming from the north. So Africa is there to be developed. Uh, Africa is there so that theories can be sent there so that we just apply uh, these theories here uh, down in the south. All these things are interlinked and, and they're at the core. At the core of it is the, the deliberate perpetual idea of Africa as a place forever needing aid. This influences, um, I believe, the opportunity for the continent uh, to, to also contribute to, to own and finance innovations and be a leader in, in the current uh, moment that we're finding ourselves in. We speak about AI um, and, and, and the possibilities uh, in terms of innovations when it comes to artificial intelligence um, that are being missed out because the, this idea of what is it that can come from Africa remains at the core, at the center. So when we talk about the need to challenge and shift away from Africa as developing that narrative. We acknowledge the intersections of all these issues that I've just mentioned. Um, the research priorities, who decides, right? Uh, much of the research foci and the agendas on what is critical, what is pertinent, what goes into the SDGs, for example, and what counts as progress continues to be viewed from the lens of the Global North framing. Um, Africa is this develop in this development frame um, is understood as developing as a site of deficit as a site of lack and Africa is seen as this site of lack that needs to catch up with Western modern advancement and many scholars have, have engaged on this many decolonial scholar African scholars have engaged on this um, in in just saying but what happens. Um, if we shift the frame, if the gaze uh, shifts where Africa also takes up its rightful place uh, within the knowledge production arena, where it's always not assumed that knowledge thinking comes from only one region of the world. And this is one layer that I think is very, very pertinent because if we can 
rethink that idea of um, Africa as perpetually developing, then we can even start understanding and acknowledging the importance of languages, right? And, and understanding the wealth of knowledge that is embedded in languages, understanding the different ways of knowing and being, understanding indigenous knowledge systems mm -hmm. as well as having uh, the possibility to, to contribute. Go back to um, issues around health as well. Some of the indigenous knowledge systems around health and well-being that have been relegated to the margins have actually been to the disservice of uh, affording the globe uh, the answers to some of the challenges that we have because it's assumed that scientific and what scientific can only one, come from one center of the world. So for me, it would be this uh, developmental gaze and the need to shift the gaze where the global South also takes its rightful place, where there can be this shift when we look about the pluriverse and, and, and uh, pluriversal understanding of the world. Okay, thanks, Palang. I mean, if, if one of the key thing, challenges you highlighted there, I want to turn to, to Peter to address um, the idea of the development gaze. I mean, has development studies lost before it started if we maintain this framing when it comes to being serious players in decolonizing um, academia more broadly? Um, Peter, where do you stand on that and, and other aspects of the Africa Charter that you think may be particularly difficult for U, uh, UK academics and academic organizations to address? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think, first of all, in the Charter, it's both inspirational and aspirational, which is great. And it's really crucial that it has a strong ownership by an array of African institutions and a very wide array of actors, as Isabella mentioned. Um, in IDS, we signed up as well because we absolutely believe that it's it's laying out a really clear uh, agenda for change. Um, and also the diagnostic, which underpins mm. the charter, I think resonates very closely with work we've been involved in at IDS, working with our partner Southern Voice and supported by Canada's um, International Development Research Centre. I'll just put the, the link in the chat to that. And um, I, we've been exploring the nature of equitable development research partnerships and trying to identify concrete actions that can address existing power imbalances in research collaborations. And obviously, as uh, actually, I'll just try and pick up a few things from the chat as well, Q&A, uh, Diana mentioned that the debate about how to establish greater equity and research partnerships is not new. It's it's long running. Um, mm -hmm. It's part of a much longer uh, engagement in development studies communities around these issues about trying to reframe, reimagine, recast the relationship of those who believe that it's really important to understand how challenges in the world, wherever they may play out, can be addressed with knowledge and experience and evidence from different sources, different forms coming together to help to address that. But in practice, to actually change towards mechanisms which support a much more inclusive and engaged approach is very difficult. And part of the reason for that is because of some of the um, barriers, I would say, particularly which are associated with funding mechanisms. So just very quickly, if I could just mention a few of those. One limitation that we've seen through our work with Southern Voice comes from a preoccupation with risk management. Let me put it as bluntly as that. Many funders, especially in the global north, um, understand risk management as necessary because of due diligence, good stewardship of funds. But the tendency towards risk averse behavior by funders is inevitably slowing down or preventing real opportunities for change. So that movement away from seeing risk as something which constrains to something which opens up um, possibilities whilst recognizing that you need to be thoughtful and intentional about how you work is really important. And I think that speaks to Divine's point about, yes, we need to open up, but we need to then get past a view that if we pay attention to risks all the time, that will actually force us to close down. Also, one of the things that's come up in our work is an over-reliance on project-based modalities to fund um, uh, research activities. So projectization has implications for research coordination, timelines, expectations for policy impact, a whole array of bureaucratic hurdles, and also one-way accountability mechanisms, all of which hinder more interesting, exploratory, flexible, and adaptive research. Also, there are constraints imposed by perspectives and metrics of research excellence. And in development research, the excellence tends to be impact-driven and also linked to aid priorities. So 
those who access funding tend to be those who've accessed research resources before and also have conformed to long-standing definitions of excellence, which themselves are now being challenged by some really innovative thinking and practice led by a number of research funders. So Ruth in the, in the Q&A talked about precarity of status and this project, this understanding of what makes excellence uh, to a rather restricted field actually excludes a number of people from engaging in research activities, uh, you know, simply because of the kind of bureaucracy and the arrangements which are which are placed around that. And then finally, I think there's a this is something that will be very important for the Africa Charter, is that there, there's in general a lack of robust accountability mechanisms and avenues for evidence and feedback which can target the more systemic and structural drivers of inequity in knowledge ecosystems. And these accountability mechanisms need to be rebuilt in ways that they're much more uh, free flowing and are not just one way where they're imposed by those who have both the power and the resources which enables them to make decisions on behalf of others. So global self researchers, communities, in order to be able to act as direct as agents of change, need to be able to bring evidence and feedback to the funders about how they are performing and how are they they are serving the interests of uh, researchers who who you know are seeking to get the support they need to carry out the research now obviously here i'm speaking mainly about challenges encountered with global north funders and i must acknowledge that there are funders now who are really committed to changing their practices but this risk averseness is still a big problem so one way to see change happen in the wider knowledge ecosystem is to have more funding originating and being dispersed by African funders. And that's already starting to happen. But it's really important that as they strengthen and diversify their approaches, they have more resources to distribute, they grow in number, that they don't just replicate the problematic practices that we've seen associated with many Global North funders over many decades of support to research for development. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Great number of challenges there. I mean, if we if we imagined what our research landscape would look like if decolonizing was taken seriously, then you can imagine every committee that we sit on and, and, and doles out money, judges applications, looks at whether African researchers are re just collecting data or uh, informing research design and so on, would look radically different. And I think we need to perhaps, if we have a further webinar, uh, we need to invite some research funders uh, onto the core. Um, Quite a number of UK-based funders are open. They are fully open to applications from Global South organisations, um, but some remain closed um, and can only be led by U UK academics. Um, Isabella, the, the issue of, of partnerships, equitable partnerships, which has been raised in the Q&A and has been, I guess, the go-to solution for um, UK development studies organisations, including uh, the GDI in Manchester. You and EARP and colleagues have written a, a paper that is quite critical of this, as, as if it, it, it supplies too easy an answer, which may actually reinforce some inequalities and not challenge the broader research ecosystem. Could you elaborate what you mean by that and what you think would provide the basis for, I guess, more genuine equitable partnerships than, that can also be linked to uh, transformations in the ecosystem? Yeah, thanks, Sam. I think the core of the critique, if you like, that we try to put forward in the paper was, I mean, first of all, to acknowledge that the, the debate, the thinking around the need for greater equity in research collaborations and partnerships um, between Africa and Global North was a very, was very important at that, and that the issues highlighted in the debate namely, you know, the concerns around asymmetries in the concrete arrangements uh, that underpin collaborations, so in the division of labour, in decision-making and control over budgets, over what happens to samples, in, you know, access to rewards, in particular authorship of joint papers, in the direction the directions of capacity building endeavors. All of those are really important. And the equitable partnerships debate so far has done a lot to highlight where the problems are, as well as suggest some of the approaches to, you know, to, 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 to um, address uh, these issues, to introduce more fairness into these arrangements. The point we were trying to make is that a focus on these, you know, if you like, more visible asymmetries 
um, risks obscuring an un a consideration, a focus on the underlying layers of power imbalance in the production of scientific knowledge, which you know we've referred to briefly at the epistemological level, language level, theories, concepts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And our our sense very much was that if we want collaborations that are configured in ways that shift or that that can you know begin to even the playing field in the production of scientific knowledge globally, then these collaborations must also redress the underlying power imbalance layers, not only those outer ones, uh, you know, that we are most concerned with when we talk about equitable partnerships. So that was, that was the critique. Yes, equitable partnerships, really important, but we need to go beyond them to look at the deeper asymmetries uh, that need redressing. So that was the um, that was the essence of the critique in that paper. The other was, and I think it's important to just highlight that briefly, uh, was the need to be very clear about the importance of structural change. So the equitable partnerships debate so far, I think it's fair to say, has focused on how asymmetries can be redressed within individual projects, you know, amongst collaborative teams. The charter and the, the charter argument says, yes, that's important, but there must be structural change, change in the guidelines, in the policies, in the regulatory frameworks of funders, of publishers, of those governance institutions that set the frames for research assessment and excellence, as Peter said, the REF in the UK. Ultimately, the policies of governments, those are the rules of the game. They determine which kinds of collaborations are incentivized, which kinds of collaborations are enabled or even mandated. So there is need for structural change. And that was not an element that was we felt sufficiently highlighted in the equitable partnerships uh, discourse so far. In terms of, uh, Philippe, yeah, thank, thanks, Isabel. Okay, let me stop here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm just uh, just aware of the time. Yes, yes. I'd, like to, I'd like to finish on something of a of a high note. So I've asked Divine and then Poleng to comment on just to identify one or at most two initiatives which they think are actually starting to meet the objectives of the Africa Charter. Uh, to give us some food for thought and some optimism going forward. Uh, Divine and then Pauline. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'm just, I would just say the fact that uh, almost every organization globally is taking equitable partnership seriously is already so big, you know, as a recognition, you know, it is part of the SDG. So uh, SDG 17 acknowledges that we are interdependent and the nature of it might be different, but it's acknowledged. Second is just the epistemic, the epistemic uh, challenge that we are facing now. The fact that we are talking about decolonization is already very important, you know. Okay. And is, is there any um, room for optimism? Have you seen something or been a part of pushing forward something which you think is actually working? Just a small initiative, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, the uh, work we are doing now around conceptual thinking concepts is really important. What, what is it to think the world through uh, 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 what you would call African concepts? Uh, like, I mean, what is development in terms of translation? What is uh, equitable in terms of translation? What is pan partnerships? I think that's very important work because it gives, makes a significant contribution to science itself, which also translates to everyday life. And I think in the next three to five years, we are going to see uh, the benefits of all that. Good stuff, but that certainly needs to happen. We need we need the way to think about this and rethink these problems. Uh, Peleng, any initiatives from your side? Um, I think we always say it's important to start at home. Uh, so it, so as we think about how these principles and aspiration can be brought to life, um, how are we ourselves doing it? So one of one of the things that we have decided to do is to to do work at an intellectual level to say what 
are the policies that are in place in many of the institutions and what is it that needs to change within those policies. Uh, but then starting at home, uh, so in our case, uh, this is the work that we're currently doing now at the University um, of South Africa and with the hope that when we have reviewed and revised and looked at all the different MOUs and partnerships that we have and to say what is it that needs to be rethought, that we can use that also um, as 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 an example of the ways in which other institutions can also follow suit. Because I think it's one thing to sign up to the charter, but another to ensure that your institution lives by the principles and aspirations. One of the very initial questions that was asked when we started the webinar was, um, how, how do we how do we um, ensure that these, these aspirations come to life? How do we ensure that these principles uh, come to life? It's, it's beautiful to say we've got more than 100 signatories, um, and some of them who have now come back to us as well and say how so how do we then apply this so i think the work that we're doing right now um is going to assist us towards um achieving and ensuring that uh, the different institutions that have signed up actually realize um these these aspirations in their institution so that it's not just another framework or charter uh, or document that was signed and then we move on um, that is not the intention here okay Thank you. And Isabella, we'll, we'll give you the last word to you as to as to uh, why we should be feeling optimistic at the moment about it, that there is progress being made uh, on this front. Thank you, Sam. I'll start with this webinar. Um, it's, I mean, you know, more than 100 people, uh, you know, have, have stayed the course, have engaged in the discussion. You know, we haven't even had the chance to answer, to engage with all the comments or the queries that have been posted. What this shows and what this is an, um, an instance of uh, is, is the really genuine and wide resonance uh, that the arguments underpinning the charter, that its ambition um, has found you know, across the sector in different spaces amongst different constituencies, people are keen to engage in the thinking and the discussing around uh, the issues that the charter raises. And I think that to me is, is, is a really, really important uh, indication that we are on the right track, uh, that we are on the right track, that the charter somehow has come at the right time. You know, this is change whose time has arrived in some ways uh, and, and people are keen to engage. And, you know, in a, in a sort of context where nobody has time, everybody's overworked, you know, nobody has bandwidth and yet, People are engaging and are keen to engage. I think that's really critical. Uh, this is this for me. This is the most precious thing, and this is what will sustain this interest, this engagement, and I suppose the value alignment that underpins much of it. That is what's going to sustain uh, the task that we now face of moving from principle uh, to finding ways to translate that into practice, and then at some point, you know developing mechanisms for accountability for the kind of change that we envision. Yeah. Thanks, Isabella. Uh, we're going to have to pause the conversation now, and I do mean pause. I suspect the, the hunger for this discussion and the quality of it, when we first started within DSA having these conversations, um, from there to here, in the Q&A, in the contributions being made, in having something concrete like the Africa Charter discussed, there's clearly been a lot of progress. But I think the discussion has highlighted many challenges um, around, at, at a structural level, really, particularly in terms of how we incentivize the right types of behaviors and institutional change uh, that need to occur for decolonizing agenda to move forward significantly, um, and how to um, hold people and institutions to account for progress there and knowing when we will have achieved progress. Um, from the chat, I think the key issue that we need to come back to is probably around funding. Um, and how that shapes incentives and how it shapes relationships. So perhaps we, we may consider um, coming back to that as a, as, a, as a key focus and getting some research funders uh, on the call. Um, but thanks very much to the DSA for, for this, to all the panelists for their excellent contributions and to the participants who have really raised the bar and posed much better questions than I had ready uh, for the panelists. So uh, many thanks for that.